know that we see you joining us and we're just waiting for a couple of other folks from our waiting room to join in. Um, so far we've got about 13 people. And we'll get started in just a moment. All right, well, thank you very, very much for joining the Mid-Atlantic Teaching Artists Virtual Retreat today. We're in our second week. My name is Susan Auchin, and I work at the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. The session today will be recorded and later shared, so please do turn off your video if you don't wish to be recorded. Today's workshop is called Applying Indigenous African Principles in the Classroom decolonizing the classroom, and will be led by Olu Butterfly Woods. Now I'm going to turn things over to our producer, Carol Kelly, for a brief review of some technical housekeeping items. Hello, everyone. My name is Carol Kelly. As mentioned, I'm the producer for today's session. I'm here to review just a few things to familiarize you with the tools you'll need to use for this Zoom meeting. Uh, I would imagine most of you have been using Zoom these past months. Uh, let's start with this screen. Uh, this, uh, this allows you to change views. If you would like to view your interpreter, you can find Laura, our interpreter today, and then look for the three dots at the top right of her picture and select pin video. You will only then see the interpreter in this view. You can also select gallery view, which is at the top right of your screen to see both interpreter and presenter. Otherwise, you can stay in active speaker view. Next screen. Thank you. Uh, troubleshooting. If you get disconnected, please rejoin using the same Zoom login that you initially joined. Uh, today's sessions are being recorded as earlier mentioned. If you do have um, technical issues and need to reach me, you can reach me on my cell number, which is shown on the screen. And you can jot that number down if you'd like to. I'd be happy to help you. Next screen. Uh, okay, in this session today, we'll be using the chat box. The chat box is found on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You can click on the word chat, it will pop out. You can then move it to one side of your screen. It's good to have this up if you're able, so you're able to act this you know, easily. Next is the participant box to the left of the chat box on the same toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Again, click on the word participants to pop it out. This box is movable whenever, wherever you'd like to move it on your screen. This box allows you to see everyone that is dialed in today. We will be reviewing the icons at the bottom of this particular box shortly. Next screen, changing your name. Here's where you can change your name if you wish. This is also the place you can add your pronouns if you choose to. So hover over your name, click more, and choose rename to change your screen name displayed to other participants. So you can go, we'll give it a minute. If you'd like, to give it a try. Okay, last screen, I believe. Okay, here we go. Uh, this is the last slide. These are the icons that are found in the participant box that I had asked you to pop out earlier. If you didn't pop it out, simply click on the word participants on the toolbar at the bottom and it'll pop right out. At the very bottom, um, you'll see these uh, icons listed. Uh, you'll see a blue virtual hand, a green yes check mark, a red no X, as well as other icons. Uh, if you found it, would you mind giving me a blue virtual hand? Anyone find the blue? There we go. And they're popping up now. Terrific. All right. Again, that's a, it's found at the bottom of your participant box. There's a little icon. Scroll way to the bottom and you'll find them. Looks like most of you have found them. So I'll go ahead and clear them. And I think uh, this is all I need to cover before we get started. So I'm happy to turn it back over to Susan. Thank 
you so much, Carol. I appreciate that. And I'm happy to introduce you to Olu Butterfly Woods. For over two decades, she has been an educator and teaching artist at schools across Baltimore. She is currently the director of Do More Baltimore, an organization using art to promote civic engagement in marginalized communities. And she's the founding co-director of Free Up Village Community Supported Education, which focuses on African STEAM edutainment spaces. For more information about Olu and her good work, look to the chat box in just a minute to download the Retreat Presenter Packet. Now, please welcome Olu and let's begin. Ah, I had it on mute. <laughs> My brain contorts, working torques on synapse forks. My breath exhorts, tongue flips south to north, bringing forth new births, creating new turfs of earth to rectify the dearth of worthwhile words. My name is Olu Butterfly, and I'm so honored to be here with you all. If this was not COVID times, I would have loved to actually dance with you and sing with you in person, um, but we're going to uh, do a couple things to try to make this interactive, if we can. Um, the pictures that you see before me, um, that is me on the back. Uh, I was born in Nigeria, um, but to a mother who's from the Bronx. So I have, I bring to you the diaspora. I also um, had an organization that would bridge Baltimore City, where I live, and uh, Ghana. We would take uh, young people from uh, here and bring them over to the continent um, to uh, see them activated and affirmed. Um, so that's some of the qualifications that bring me here to you today. And um, what I'd like to do first is we call on spirit first. And today um, we are um, going to do some libations, if that's okay with you all. I do not see the chat. Um, I need to work on that. I don't see the chat. So I don't know if people can unmute, but what we do, libation, if everybody can see me, um, we start with water because water transcends and connects us to um, spirit and all the elements. Everything that's alive needs to drink a little bit. And um, I have an altar behind me. Uh, that has some different elements. Like I have a 200 year old um, cannon uh, from the slave dungeons in Ghana, for example. If you all choose that as something to discuss today, I'll talk to you about it a little bit more. But I would like to um, recall on our ancestors, our blood ancestors first. And um, so I'm gonna do that. This is something that I do um, in my sessions also with young people. Um, we call on the energy that we like to be here. So, first I'd like to call on my grandmother, Esther Butler, and we say, Ashe. Um, this is where I usually invite other people to say some things. Charles Thomas, my grandfather, we say, Ashe. Ashe. Alan Marvin Woods is uh, my father in spirit. We say, Ashe. Ashe. And we also called on our collective ancestors. So there's people who you might not be related to by blood, but they represent, you still draw strength from them and you're part of their lineage through your work and your philosophies, etc. So in that spirit, I'd like to call on Harriet Tubman. I say, Ashe. 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 Robert Nesta Marley, we say, Ashe. 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 Ashe is like, so be it raise it up all right and um we also call on those unnamed in particular because of what happened with my family there's so many ancestors whose names i do not know so we honor them we say ashe we, we, we honor the indigenous people um who have kept the land for many thousands of years before we arrived here we say ashe and all the creepy crawlers and uh, the uh, the flights and the plants and all the things that allow us to exist. We say Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you all for that, um, for sharing in me, sharing with me in that. 
And um, so today, obviously, um, you know, I'm not going to pretend that we're going to be able to talk about everything ever within an hour. I don't want to even dishonor the information as if we could do that. But we are going to explore. Um, uh, we're going to explore a couple of different things, especially um, we're going to take a poll shortly to see what you all want to talk about. So, but if you don't get anything else from today, I'd love for you to get relationships. Like that is what this is all about really, is about relationships, bringing relationships into our classrooms, the re relationship between learner and educator, the relationship between the learner and the material and, um, and so on. So relationships, that is key. So we are, um, I'm your village guide. And um, we'd like to start your journey here in the village with us today with a song. The song is a, a griot song, or we call it the jolly. They're the people who hold the history. And it goes with a dance that opens up a portal between um, the spiritual world and the physical world. So my daughter, Adwa, is going to help me with this. You ready? OK. And I have to say that I am not a singer, but if you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing, all right? So I'm not the village singer, but we're gonna sing today. If I could and it wasn't gonna sound real crazy, I would totally have you all sing with me and teach you the song. You have to come in, you have to come here with me. Okay, here we go. Oh, la di bo mansiya, ni kele bo elai elai. Simbo mansia, e jalia. Oh, my mansia, ni kelebo elayla. Simbo mansia, e jalia. Oh, lady bo mansia, ni kelebo elayla. Simbo mansia, e jalia. Thank you all. So right now we have a poll to see what we're going to talk about today. So um, we have several different um, elements. And this is just one way to look at it. This is me um, collecting what I have learned and experienced over time. So I would love for you all to pick one of those topics to explore communal living. If you want to look at new ways to um, tie the classroom together and build on agreement as a form of accountability and learning, elder ancestor reverence, that continuum between a learner and educator, fluidity between physical and spiritual, harmony with nature, and uh, rites of passage, uh, which calls on our young people to go through a process, which education is to transform and um, ways to kind of lean on them a little bit more in that process. So whenever, Please uh, do vote. And then I'm going to wait for somebody to tell me the answer, to tell me where we're going to go um, with this talk. We have about 62% of the votes in. I can give okay. it another 10 seconds. And then I'll end the poll and I'll share the results. Because I have way too much to talk about. We could spend a week together, but we only have a little tiny bit of time. so. Um, we're going to do one thing of your choice, and then I'm also going to talk about specifically art, of course, because that's part of why we're here today, to talk about arts integration and um, the arts. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. We have about 75% in. Okay, thank you. And then I'll share the results. You should be able to see them on your screen. Harmony with nature. I love you guys. Okay. <laughs> thank you. So I have it in alphabetical order, so I'm going to find this slide. All right, so um, what I have here is two um, proverbs. Um, one says, the ax forgets, the tree remembers. And um, I take that to be that there's some things of our creation, sometimes it's used to build and destroy. Um, but the tree we can always go back to as a grounding. That's just my personal interpretation. <laughs> um, there's several things you can get from that. Um, and my the second, 
uh, proverb says, wisdom is like the baobab tree. No one individual can embrace it. And um, for me, that means that um, nature is sort of like the plan. Um, and you can always lean into it, lean on it, and um, as a way, you know, to, to do whatever it is that you need to do. Um, the wisdom of that, of that entity um, allows you to be fuller than just yourself. So, um, harmony with nature. I have here a picture of the Arisha. This is in the Ifa tradition, which I grew up with. So we have uh, a picture of three goddesses. Um, some people feel like um, we are uh, like African people, like worship a piece of wood. Absolutely not. <laughs> um, but they are embodiments. So a lot of times the deities are embodiments of nature. So Yemaya um, is the sea. Oshun is, is the river. And it's about uh, Yemaya is the mother who will also engulf you, cut you down lovingly, <laughs> tough love. That's the, the spirit of like the sea and the ocean. Oshun is also, um, well, the, uh, the ocean, the, the also water. I guess Yemaya is the river. Oshun is sweetness. Um, but there's also different aspects to that. And Oya is the wind, the winds of change. That's what we're all experiencing right now. It's very uncomfortable. This time period is full, full of change, right? But that's what brings the seeds around, makes things new again. That's Oya's job. So um, we also have um, an Adinkra symbol. You will see that throughout my presentation. Um, they are, uh, symbols and they're based in reality. So this one is two crocodiles. So um, with indigenous, uh, we look to nature and um, we, get, uh, we get ideas for how to live. Um, we model different aspects of nature. Um, and so that's also what the bird mask is about. So in this village, you may find people as they are harmonizing with nature, uh, using herbal healing. And um, so right now, as people are debating what is some good remedies and immune building, um, we're using mullein tea, for example. Um, uh, that's good for your lungs, wet cough, dry cough. So we have that, I've had to share that out among the community, that's just one example. Um, and natural technology, uh, being able to, um, uh, the technology not being such an extraction, but working with nature. And um, I'm going through some of these, but um, I want us to start thinking about like how this can be applied inside the classroom. Cause I'm gonna invite people to um, share some things and we'll see how that goes with this presentation interactively. So uh, natural technology, foraging and agriculture. Um, uh, my son goes to forest school around here, so he spends like five hours in the woods um, foraging, learning what materials you can eat if you need to, or just because you want to, or what can be used as a salve. Um, accepting the continuum, recycle, reusing, repurpose. You use the whole, um, uh, use the whole thing, right? Uh, I have a drum, for example, and there's some people that eat goat meat. I do not, <laughs> but. Um, the skin, nothing is wasted, all right? And everything is repurposed. Uh, that's why plastic is sort of wreaked havoc on, um, you know, in indigenous populations, because if you're eating an avocado, the pit, you could just throw somewhere, but that doesn't work for um, some of the things that we have here. But that circle of life, that cycle of life, patterns, rhythms, cycles, our heartbeat, the seasons, um, looking to those to set time and to shape um, what we do. Nature is grounding, it's balance, um, and using it for programming. So as educators, we do, that's what we do. We program people as people who transmit culture. We pro Young people are ready and ripe for programming. I used to resist that word as an Aquarius, like I don't want to be programmed, um, but that's, that is what we do. It doesn't have to be bad. And so using, um, like for example, 
uh, lavender tea or chamomile tea. I have a really robust, rambunctious um, son. I have four children. So we might take that in the evening. And that replaces me saying, hey, settle down, be quiet. I can use this tea, right? So nature is all providing. Like what is there that you can't get from it? Um, even if we have not discovered all the purposes of a particular plant, you can often use the bark for one thing, the stem for another, the leaf in this season for this thing, the fruit, it's just so beautiful. Um, plants, I feel like plants can do absolutely everything. If I had a religion, it would be like plants. If somebody's saying they have an issue, I'm like, what plant can we use? Um, biomimicry, uh, as we look to um, new social systems or organizing, a lot of times you can find something in old social systems. So biomimicry is, you know, how we use nature to, um, to uh, dive into uh, new to solutions. Um, there's a lot of reverence in, in this system for um, like the lion, for example, who is like the king of the jungle. But of course, those like top feeders, they end up um, vulnerable to extinction. What are some other things that we can model ourselves after, right? Animal totems. So there is animals that you may relate to, that particular groups relate to. So in this village, um, my middle name is Butterfly. I've always related to the butterfly, both for transformation, not standing still, and some more things, right? So what is your animal totem? Uh, deities are forces of nature, applying elements to titles or interactions. So bringing that balance um, in the Dagar culture, for example, they have a council of elders, but you don't just stop there. You have an elder that represents fire, an elder that represents water, um, you know, uh, uh, and minerals. So you have your different elements um, within the titles to bring that balance. Um, healers who can, this is what I admire, who can talk directly to nature and, um, and get the information that way. It's a kind of studying, a kind of science. So um, George Washington Carver, which many people are familiar with, um, this is a gift that he said that he had. He would talk to the plants, and that's how he got a lot of his ideas and information. Um, they don't put that in a lot of biographies. Um, eliminating obsessions with categories, that idea that things need to be binary, um, or, um, and that they can exist on a continuum, or through the binary, you can create multiple um, systems that are rich. And so that's modeling tandem binary. Uh, versus either or thinking. So um, these are um, some of the ideas that we have, right? That's how you can see it in the village. Um, so how do we bring this into the classroom? Um, I have some ideas and examples here, but I really wanted to see if I could hear from you all either something familiar that maybe you already do, or if you have like an idea of like, hey, I could do this. So I don't know um, if we have a way to um, either, if somebody could help me read from the chat or um, if we can unmute people who raise their hand perhaps, um, if anybody has any um, thoughts. Um, and if not, I can keep talking, but I'd love to hear from you all. How about if folks want to talk? This is Susan. If folks want to talk, go ahead and raise your hand using the blue hand raise button. I'll see you in the participant list and then Olu, I can share with you. We can unmute people okay. one at a time. Um, and if you're having a hard time finding the raise hand button, then feel free to chat your question and I'll keep my eye there as well. Okay. That would just make me feel good. Trust me, I can talk. I can keep talking. <laughs> So um, I guess I'll talk in, until I'm interrupted, I guess. So these ideas and examples are some things that I kind of pulled out. Um, the herbal programming that I was talking about, um, aromatherapy, you know, I had to, to do um, a classroom of kindergartners, for example. And so even the smells that they walk into as, as a way to um, set an environment. Um, and then um, of course, recycling and reusing, uh, modeling that, how can we do that? How can we involve that in our practice? 
uh, in our classroom, do we have the presence of the various elements in nature um, represented? Do we have living plants? Do we have water? Uh, do we have, uh, it can be a very tactile experience, um, you know, depending on what age group you're working with. Uh, I find people really love to dig their hands in soil. It can be very calming, um, like mental health, <laughs> even a grounding um, to do that, um, to just like even touch soil. There's just uh, so much tactile um, elements with, uh, with nature, bringing that into our classroom. And um, I see it as the ultimate life lessons of seeing a seed grow to maturity. I feel like that alone, like as, mu as many times as our young people can experience that because it's such a rich reference um, where they, uh, that idea where you have to kind of have faith, you have this seed, it doesn't really look like what it's gonna look like at all. They plant it and then next thing you know, it has to go struggle through that darkness to come out and then you have this little baby shoot and then somehow it grows into something um, really full and mature whether it's something you can eat just look at or breathe in um, I think that that is such a reference um, for life and I think it can be applied everywhere um, so inviting our young people to to that experience um, food, uh, looking at food holistically, um, that's the harmony piece. Food is a way to get the energy of the sun into our bodies. Um, that's what I tell even my children who want to bring like sugar from the corner store um, into our lives um, and things like that. Like this is not really what food is for. It's for getting that some, some food has more energy from the sun than others. Um, so looking at that holistically being barefoot more often. Um, I think people around here really freak out about being barefoot. Um, I dance um, and I've danced outside a whole lot and without shoes. So as long as it's not like on hot concrete and blistery, there's so much information that you get from being barefoot. Um, so uh, it's actually a whole set of senses and, and intelligence and information that comes through there and it's very grounding. And um, I feel like, especially our young people, um, that you know they might kind of grow into a level of discomfort with being barefoot, but um, I feel like people definitely benefit from that. Um, and oh, I put that there, the neem tea and the mullein tea. Um, neem is a, another miracle plant. And, um, but a lot of times what you need tends to grow right where you are, you know, dandelion, um, for example, we look at them as roots, um, as leaves, but they have so many um, properties, especially the leaves as a diuretic, a cleanser. So when you look around you, like the, the ailments that you have or a particular place that I'll be experiencing, what you need tends to grow right around you, which I think is so just beautiful and miraculous. And um, problem solving. Um, when you're having an issue thinking hmm how does nature solve this what would nature do and um and i find that uh nature as well as um particularly i'm a tree hugger i don't know if i have any other tree huggers in the house um when you need that grounding that emotional grounding sometimes it's like a hug from nature or being in nature is absolutely the remedy um it's it's extremely grounding. So I don't know if I had any, any, any other comments or questions. You have some really great ones. And okay, would you like sorry, me? Sorry, I shouldn't have been talking through that. Okay, go no, ahead. No, no, it's great. Um, how about if I just read them off and then yes, please. they're, okay, great. So Gina Rice says, I do a meditation for students to connect with their spirit animals. Mm -hmm. Then we create a clay animal from that meditation. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Jennifer Ridgway says, I use aromatherapy in my dramas quite a lot to set the moods and engage students in specific characters. Wow, I love that. Amber Coppings um, has contributed that she works with adult women in recovery from addiction. They take daily walks. 
we've started to incorporate natural ink making and dyes using flowers that they forage for wow, every morning. I love that. It helps them put peace and creativity at the beginning of their day Absolutely. and take some time each week to really focus on gaining new skills. Mm -hmm. And then um, Samantha Clark, this is the last one, is I love the idea of looking to nature to remove the binary. I think there's so much to learn about the cycle of life and how this can remove the binary of good things happening to good or bad people. Yes, thank you. I love, I love all of that. And um, thank you for affirming, um, looking to nature um, about uh, the binary and the either or thinking um, that has a lot of us stuck. We have a two party system, kind of. There's other options, but um, for example, and so that kind of creates this really interesting tension, the either or of it. Um, so yeah, permeates this particular culture, but we can choose um, what we do in our classrooms. And so, um, so some things to just kind of take away from this is how much time do you spend in nature? I know there are times when I'm more or less, um, what is in the immediate environment of you? Um, and how can you make whatever you do more eco-friendly? Um, so I know that um, I'm not personally an ink maker, but I love um, considering that skill. Um, it, I'm a poet and in my in writing class, maybe we can consider like making poems with, our, with ink that we made. I love that. Um, and you know, going into depth in that way. And so um, I want to, uh, the, the next element I'd like to talk about, and like I said, you know, this thinking here is, um, is the way that I kind of divided up these principles, but they are not like universal and they really overlap. So I definitely wanted to talk about art since we are here. Um, uh, definitely to talk about um, art collectively as a part of this whole conference. So I have this um, proverb here that says, you are beautiful, but learn to work for you cannot eat your beauty. So what this is saying to me, I don't know what it says to you, is that um, what I call this is functional art. Art is, is um, it's here to do work. So the idea that uh, art in this in the village, art is utilitarian versus decorative and aesthetic. Like it is, it's here to do work. So in this picture, um, we have uh, capoeira, which is um, sorry, I don't know if that disappeared for you all too. So we have capoeira, which is um, an and Angolan, Afro-Brazilian uh, martial arts form. And it very much involves singing and it looks like dance. Um, they had to disguise it in order to train and, um, and they repurposed their bow and arrow into instruments, as you can see. So this idea that it's, um, everything is kind of moving together. And even in African martial arts, there's singing and there's music. Um, the idea of the drummer boy, I think, came from there. So um, I also have a picture of fabric. The fabric often tells a story, like um, each year or each season, they come out with new fabric patterns and they have names and they can indicate different things and tell different stories. And I also have um, the pattern in the young lady's hair corn rolled. Um, so um, sometimes that's even been a map. So the idea that um, we don't have time for like aesthetics just to be, we, everything has to be doing something. So that's this art versus a museum and a museum, the art kind of sits up uh, static and still versus being used and in the home and, um, uh, and in that way. And that art is food versus some like something reserved for the privilege. So this idea that like art um, is uh, yes for um, the access of the privilege, but it's something that everybody needs in order to eat. It's a part of life. Like you have to 
um, take it in. And um, it is items from spirit for spirit. Art is the inside of the world. Art is art as ritual. Um, song and dance are functional. Um, it's not just like for no reason. We're gonna take a video with that. Music accompanies everything. Everything can represent, can have flair, can have personality. So a spoon, you know, it could just be this. I mean, even don't get me wrong, the clean shape and design can do something, but it can also, um, there can be a personality put even in something like the spoon or the fork, right? Um, so just everything can be infused with spirit um, and personality. Um, and everything is multidisciplinary. So it's not this, that there goes that um, continuous, um, not necessarily binary thinking, that these things come together. Um, and so uh, I wanted to show a couple of different um, examples of this. So on the left is um, in a comb which is actually spiritual healing. Um, oh, I need to get this together. Is it gonna let me do this? So um, the Akom is, um, is a ritual where people come together and um, as you can see the drumming and the dancing, partly what's happening here is uh, people are it's actually a healing um, for the community. And a lot of times messages may be channeled, but the drums themselves, uh, I wanna say um, that's that harmony with nature. It, the drums themselves evoke um, different resonance and patterns that affect the body. And so um, we can see here what's going, a little bit of what's going on from afar. <laughs> Okay. everybody the the dancer um and it has they have their to this position um, or spirits and those their clothes um, there might be to make sure that is away from them. <laughs> of the moment. Topy, I'm gonna go to my next. Let's see if we can do this one. So this is in Tanzania, and um, a lot of times um, the, the singing, um, if we were together, I would have taught you a harvest uh, dance and song. And, and so a lot of times when there's a big labor to be performed, the singing is what keeps everybody together. So the idea of singing in the farm is, is probably not foreign 
um, but they also may do it um, with uh, uh, fishing. So keeping everybody um, in the rowing, um, in the proper powerful rowing cadence, as well as building, even building a house. So having to transport heavy things. Um, it might be very intense for a short period of time and then they switch out and then other people come and replace them. And the person that keeps the, the timing is the musician. So, oh man. <laughs> Every time I'm clicking it, it's going away. Let's see if I hover. So this is in Tanzania and this brings me so much joy. So hopefully it works and brings you some joy too. about apply art, especially because I need you all to join me. Like every few years, they decide that art is the core subject. And I'm like, I thought it already was the core subject. And, and it's like art always has to continuously justify its existence and investment. Um, and we know that, um, you know, so I did an example, of course, arts integration. There is no subject that can't use art. There's no, it doesn't exist. Art can be infused with every single subject. Um, the classroom space, art can be everywhere. Um, it should be accessible. It can invoke more creativity in all the elements um, from your, if you have a drill, if you have um, the tools that you're using, um, just more creativity. If it, it speaks life, uh, more beauty and expression. Um, uh, art is ki critical for mental health um, to, uh, you know, keep us grounded, to keep us healthy, um, to calm our anxiety, to um, help us to transcend um, and just be mentally healthy. Uh, cultural identity, art is meant to um, include us, affirm us, critical thinking. It's a kind of thinking, it's a kind of processing and brings personal continuity. And so I'm saying that because art is not decoration on the side. It is literally can be infused everywhere. And to look at it as these other things um, helps people to understand that it's not, its involvement is critical. Um, and so some of my imaginings and questions are, how does your art practice reflect relationships? And how does your classroom practice express your passionate relationship with art in your greater life? So, you know, we all talk about like, what happens in a world without art? Are you bringing those things that you love and are passionate about into your classroom, into your interaction with, with young people, or even in 
even in the meetings that you have about um, what you're doing. Um, so um, I don't know if we have any, um, I think we, I don't know if there's somebody that can assist. I don't know if anybody has any um, comments on this. I want to show um, one other video. Um, does anybody have any? Is there anything, is there anybody to read the chat? <laughs> sure, yeah, I, okay. I'm seeing. Um, Does any, if anybody has any comments or questions about applied art, mostly I'm inviting you to continue to defend art with me. <laughs> and that art is not this decorative thing that's uh, nice and cute, that it is um, key to a whole human being and it's food. So, um, yes, did you have something you want to say? Feel free to unmute yourself if you do and, and chime right in. <laughs> well, um, I can also invite people. Um, I'm going to pray for this slide that this video works like it did when I tried to play it before. Um, so this is um, uh, uh, this is about um, decolonizing um, curriculum. And I'd like to share this. It's from the Diné Nation. And um, I'm hoping that this works for us today. <laughs> Dr. Philosophy in Maori Studies, Indigenous Studies, Environmental Studies, and Education. Um, there's no equivalent to this in Turtle Island. I call the United States Turtle Island. Um, it's a cool thing that people are doing. You should try it. It's nice. Because America is after Amerigo Vespucci, who was a pirate looking for slaves and gold, you know, be that. Okay, so these are tribal universities, right? But they're not the same because they're still funded by the very same government who tried to wipe us from the face of the earth. So we're still pandering to their standards and not really allowed to be who and what we are in these universities. I want to take it a step further, and we're working on this right right now, where we indigenize both the curriculum and the instructional methods. So in other words, can we learn through ceremony? Can we learn through outdoor experience? Can we learn through community service? Can we learn through experience itself? Not reading about it, but doing it. Can we learn through projects and learn as a community? Also indigenize how we evaluate student success allow students to present their research findings through dance, through song, through film, through ceremony, through art, through architecture, through food production, and, and, and confirm and affirm that these forms of presentations of information are valid and true. Community elders define success and learning objectives instead of colonial institutions. So there's one school, it's a, it's a K through fifth grade school in New Mexico where I'm from, and they have, they did a, uh, um, a survey of all the elders in the community and they said, what is a successful human being? And the elders told them in their own language. And so all of their teaching is teaching to those objectives of creating a successful human as defined by the elders. Thank you. So one reason I really want to do this is to give our youth direction and purpose. As you can see, these are three different headlines of three different native reservations who have declared a state of emergency because their youth are committing suicide at such a high rate. And I think if we had these universities, our youth would be excited because they would have a program that they're working on. They would have a master's degree that they're working towards or maybe even a high school level type thing. And maybe their certificate or their degree isn't a piece of paper that said, congratulations, you, you, you uh, graduated from this university. 
maybe the degree is something more traditional, like this red belt. I got this red belt when I was 14, after I had my first menstruation. And this was their degree. They said, you are now graduating into womanhood. So we can rethink everything and give these children a place to learn where they're actually going to succeed and do well. Because they don't do well in the Western institutions because A, they're speaking English, which is not our first language. And B, we're talking about Columbus all the time and we don't want to hear that. So, thank you. So um, I wanted to share a, a little case study and then take some questions and answers. So. If we were together, we would do this, um, but I'm gonna still invite you to, um, this was an arts integration piece I did um, with uh, uh, these wonderful kindergartners. I don't know if you see them. There's a book called Elmer, and it is about an elephant who is very different and is full of personality. Uh, he is, um, made out of patchwork as opposed to the regular grayish brownish of an elephant and not only that he's full of fun and excitement um he makes everybody laugh and he brings joy and um in the end um his uniqueness um was uh celebrated for a moment he wanted to be like everybody else and then they um decided to have an elmer day where everybody would dress up like him and he would dress up like them. So um, this is, uh, um, so what we did was, you know, uh, we read the book, but we used, we used the book as an invitation to community um, because that's what I felt very present in there. And so what we did, we did a process where everybody created their own um, patterns um, in the strip. So they use crayons and then they use um, watercolors to um, go over that and created these wonderful um, designs. So my daughter uh, did some of these. One of them was her favorite foods. She put her favorite foods and kind of made a pattern and the strips and then we cut it up so that our elephant that we created was not just made up of our own, but we, uh, this, is, this is my daughter's elephant. She's supposed to be here to present to you all, but she, she went to the left. His name is Alex, and he's made up of strips that our family created. So we looked at um, just different things that represented us, and also Adinkra symbols, and a Adinkra symbols are particularly from an area in what is known as Ghana today. And it's been, there's like hundreds of them and they've been used for hundreds of years. And they mean different, really wonderful uh, things. Anything you could think of is represented and they kind of come from nature. Um, they're abstractions um, from nature. So um, I don't speak tree very well, but this is, Aquafina, which means courage and valor. Uh, this is dynamism and versatility. So um, my daughter recreated that one, this one up here in the corner. And, um, and, and then we, um, they started off with just some shapes and they created it and they turned it into an elephant somehow. And, um, and then we, uh, eventually put these on puppet sticks to recreate the story. And then we did a whole dance and we told elephant jokes um, to kind of bring it to life. So the idea that we were creating from community. Um, so if we were together, my time is kind of coming to a close. I wanted to um, invite people to create kind of a um, three to create from uh, what, how you represent in your, uh, lear your learning and teaching philosophy to think of uh, three different, this is only a small representation in front of you, 
there are several, there are hundreds. Um, and we got to go to the village in, in, um, in, in Tonso where they make a black dye and um, they create uh, the stencils, the stamps out of calabash and they put it on the fabric. Um, so uh, these are just some of them. So we kind of are running out of time because I really did want to invite people to um, create their own pattern of three. Um, but as you can see, um, feel free to look up Adenkra symbols um, and uh, knowledge, strength, adaptability, energy. Um, these are just different um, elements that maybe can be incorporated um, to affirm identity or like what philosophy, um, what your philosophy or personality or daily living is and maybe create something together based on that. So um, yes, yeah, sorry we ran out of time, but I'd love to take any questions and um, if there are any or comments. If folks have comments, this is Susan. Um, feel free to either raise your hand or chat them out. I can read them out or just unmute yourself and chime right in. I think we have about time for about three, three questions. Alex would like to know <laughs> if you have anything that you'd like to say. These are some of the strips I wanted to show you. <laughs> Anybody wanna chime in with a question or comment for Olu? It makes me feel less lonely. <laughs> I can't wait till we can all be together again. Okay, so Amber is saying she'll, she's definitely gonna um, go through the Adinkra symbols and create a pattern and she loves your Elmer activity. Thank you, Amber. And you're getting some good thanks. Thank you. Thank you all for yeah. spending um, your hour with me. Thank you Amber. so much for sharing. This was incredible and amazing and beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you all so much for attending today's session. And before we do end and all dial off, we'd like to take a minute to hear from you all about how this workshop resonated with you. So Carol is going to post just a quick exit poll, if you wouldn't mind taking just a minute to answer three quick questions. So Carol, feel free. Thank you so much. Um, also want to let you know that recordings of this workshop and all of our workshops will be available on NASA's YouTube page within the week. So um, we will be able to share that with you really soon. Please have a look at our Facebook group. I'm going to chat you the link and join us there to share your reflections about today's workshop. Also want to remind you that every Friday of the retreat, we're going to send you a weekly survey to let us know how we're doing what you think, so keep your eye on the inbox. And lastly, just to remind that the 2020 Mid-Atlantic Teaching Artists Virtual Retreat is a co-sponsored project of the Mid-Atlantic State Arts Agencies in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. We're so grateful for the generous support of all of these collaborators and so grateful for your participation today. Olu, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And with that, uh, I wish everyone a great afternoon. Bye-bye. You can follow me at Olu Butterfly on Instagram. <laughs> Thank you. Stay in touch. Thank you. All right. Great, very good, everybody. Thank you so much. Carol, I have stopped recording, so feel free to also stop recording on your end.